Oh, the Holy Spirit be upon her, Lord Jesus. Let your power flow within her, Lord Jesus. Let your words come out of her mouth, Lord Jesus. Let your will be done here tonight, Lord. Let your will be done in her lives, in her life, Lord. Let your word come forth and touch every heart here tonight, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. You are an awesome God. You are the holy of holies. You are the prince of peace, the great I am. You are the great physician. You are the great healer. You are our Lord and Savior. Lord, we are the redeemer, Lord. You are the Lord that created the heaven and the earth, Lord Jesus. And we created all things for us, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for the promises. I thank you for your word. And I thank you for what you have done and continue to do in our lives, Father. We thank you, we exalt you here tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Jesus, hallelujah. Sorry about that. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. Oh, Lord, we ask for your fire, Lord. Father, purge us, Father, from those things that stop us from doing what you've called us to do. Oh, Father, we ask, Lord, that you show us those parts, Lord, that are deep within us that you need to purge out of us, Father. Father, we ask, Lord, that no matter what, Father, Father, that you would show us those things. Father, we want to be pure before you. Father, we want to be vessels of honor, Father, for your house. Father, we want to be a living sacrifice for you. Father, show us, Lord, those innermost parts, Father, the parts that we don't even see, Father. We ask that you reveal them to us as we read your word and be obedient to you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Are, are we on Facebook? Hello, everyone on Facebook. I'm filling in for my husband tonight. He couldn't be here. And tonight, we're going to talk about preparation for revival. This church, for it's been a few months now, we have come here on Monday nights, and we have been seeking God to expose those inner parts in us. to clear the way for the Holy Spirit to use us on this earth because that is our purpose on why we are here. And sometimes we become discouraged in this preparation because we come and we pray and, and maybe some Monday nights we don't see the manifest glory of God. We don't see things happening. But I'm here to tell you tonight, do not lose hope because things are going to happen. I believe that with all my heart. I believe it's what God wants and it's his promise to us. And I just want to speak a little bit about preparation for revival. And I'm going to read Psalm 85. That's my main text. But I'll be speaking on different aspects of revival. I'm just going to read it so you'll be familiar with it. 
Psalm 85. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thy anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thy anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh, them, for them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Sorry, it looks like I need a battery. No, no good? You want me to use the hand mic? Okay. Okay, all right. Okay, where did I leave off? I'll start with verse eight. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth meet together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So tonight, as I said, we're going to talk about preparation for revival. And the title of my message is Revive Us Again, Lord. Revive Us Again. In Ephesians, I mean, you can put this stuff up if you want, or you can not put it up. It's, it's up to you, or you can write it down. But I... Um, I put the scriptures in my notes because it's easier than, because I'll be here all night if I don't do that. The first scripture I'm going to speak of tonight is, God is calling his people to wake up. Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ shall shine on you, Ephesians 5.14. When I read that scripture, I have read the book of Ephesians so many times 
and chapter 5 so many times, and for some reason, I never really paid attention to this scripture. But Paul wrote that because it was something that the people needed to do. They needed to wake up. He called them sleepers. He said, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Amen? Revival is a time when a sleeping church wakes up and begins to experience the presence of Christ in a fresh new way. And that's what we have been experiencing here. There's no doubt of the desperate need for revival or spiritual awakening in the church today. God always sets his people to prayer in anticipation of an awakening. And that's what Pastor has had us do. He has had us set ourselves in prayer. Revival praying is more than just asking for revival as part of a long list of things that we want from God. It involves positioning ourselves before the Lord in humility and in repentance. Amen. And that's just what we've been doing. We've been positioning ourselves in front of the Lord in humility and in repentance, asking God to show us those things that we need to have cleaned up. This is a prayer that recognizes our own role in the sad condition of the church and in society today. And it's sad. You know, for years and years, I, I've been asking God, why don't we see your power? Why don't we see your presence? And now, now he's revealing those things to us. Amen? Thank God for his Holy Spirit. Revival prayer is a prayer of desperation that believers of the Lord are hoping for his intervention. Amen? We're hoping for God's intervention because we can't do anything on our own. Revival praying prepares the way for the Holy Spirit to come in with his transforming power to change our lives. That's what we need. We need his transforming power to change our lives. One of the great struggles in revival praying is the amount of faith it requires to continue in steadfast prayer. As I said in the beginning, we become weary when we don't see things happening quickly. But God is not worried about our time schedule. He, to him, it doesn't matter that we've been praying for three months. That doesn't concern him. Prayerlessness is one of the greatest hindrances that the church has against us. And we know that from being Christians for all these many years. You have a potluck. People come that you haven't seen in months. You have prayer. Where are they? There's hardly anybody here. And it's, it's not just this church. It's all the churches. This is not a three-step plan to change the world in three weeks or less. It is a determination to pray until we see God move or we die in the effort. Don't give up. I'd rather die putting the effort in what God has called me to do than not. Amen? Revival is possible anywhere, anytime, if the conditions of God are met. God has conditions. Just like we have conditions for our children and everything, God has conditions for his children. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And everybody knows that scripture in Ephesians 3.20. God demands sacrifice on which to kindle his flame. Amen? It's going to cost us. This is not going to be easy. This is only the beginning. His fire does not fall on empty altars. Self-sacrifice and obedience need to be on that altar. It's going to take self-sacrifice and obedience. And that's not easy. You know, 
our children, they don't obey us, they don't listen to us, we're just as bad. We need to have self-sacrifice and obedience towards our Father. Our talents and our handicaps are, uh, and our abilities are our stumbling blocks. We don't realize what we're even doing, but we've got to just, I mean, look at the Apostle Paul, how many years, and Moses, how many years did they go away so God could get out of them everything that he needed to get out? Years. Moses was 40 years. I don't know, Paul, seven years. I don't know how long he was gone. But um, God had to get everything out of them so that they were not relying on their own talents and their own abilities because sometimes those things can be handicaps to us. In revival, the race is either neither swift or intellectually strong. That's not revival. It's not going to be through our intellect. It's not going to be through our strength. It's going to be God, all God. We say we have abilities, therefore the Lord should use us. No, that's not true. Just because you get saved and you come into the house of God and, and in the natural you're, you're a school teacher, well, you think, well, I should be up there teaching, I'm a school teacher, or I, I should be in Sunday school teaching, I'm a school teacher. No, God doesn't work like that. Read Matthew 16, 25. God does things opposite of what the world does. Matthew 16, 25 says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. The key word there is lose his life for my sake. The person who saves their life, they're the one that's out there doing what they want to do. They're going to lose their life. But those of us that give our life for God's sake, we're going to be the ones that are going to be found. Amen? And in 1 Corinthians 1, 28, it says, In the base things of the world, in the things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring not things that are. So, you know, the world thinks that they're all this and, and a bag of chips, as they say. I guess that was like a long time ago. But, <laughs> but that's not the way God works. That's just saying <laughs> Amen. The Bible is opposite on, from the way the world thinks. Thank God. Something to think about. Is it possible that revival pivots on Joel 2, verse 12 and 17? It says, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting and with weeping, and with mourning, let the priest and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. That's what we need to do. We need to be weeping between the porch and the altar. We need to turn our hearts totally to him with fasting and weeping and mourning. How many times have we done that? You hear of um, these great prayer warriors of old, and they spent hours and hours in prayer. I know we can't because we work, but we can spend a lot more time than what we do already, and God is waiting for us there. Amen. Psalm 126.6 says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bringing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Bearing precious seed. We have that precious seed in our basket. We have the answer to this dying world.
Next, what does God expect of us before he will visit us by his spirit? First, we need to remember that nothing, absolutely nothing, will happen without prayer, prayer, and more prayer. Amen? Nothing's going to happen without that. And this is a famous scripture. It's always quoted. 2 Chronicles 7.14. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, as we saw in Psalm 126.6 shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves with him. I think I messed that up. Second Chronicles 7.14. Jesse, can you put that up there? Is, is it up there already? If my people which are called by my name, that's, here we go. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If my people, which are called by my name, we're called by his name, amen, will humble themselves. We are a proud people. We need to humble ourselves and we need to pray and we need to seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. Then he said, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen? We must be honest with God as we pray and honest with ourselves. That's pretty hard to do. We need to be honest with ourselves. As we consider how God sees us, let's not try to impress God with our humility or our goodness. He knows us better than we do. We cannot cover up or minimize our sin, but recognize it as rebellion, because that's what sin is. It's rebellion. Rebellion against God. 1 John 1.10 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. How true is that? If we say that we have not sinned, we have made him a liar, and his word is not in us. Isaiah 63.10 says, But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. God will fight against us. If we don't do what he's asking us to do, it says in Isaiah 63.10 again, But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. I don't want God fighting against me, because I know I'll lose. We must humble ourselves, recognizing that outside of Christ, we have absolutely no hope of satisfying God. There was no way that we could satisfy God without Jesus Christ. Amen? And all our righteous acts are as filthy rags. That's what Isaiah 64, 6 says. All our righteous acts are as filthy rags. If it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ, we would never enter, have a, an opportunity to enter into the kingdom of God. There is only cleansing through the blood of Christ. Colossians 1, 20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross... That's where the peace came from, through the blood of the cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him. I say, whatsoever they be things on earth or things in heaven. All sin must be admitted and confessed. And it must be confessed fully. Confessing only partial parts of your sin you might as well not even have confessed any of it because that will get you nowhere. God does not accept partial confession. Unlike our judicial system, there is no statute of limitations on sin that has not been confessed. Amen? Sin is sin. It, it, it doesn't run out because we sinned 20 years ago. Sin is sin. Time does not erase unconfessed sin. 
Psalm 139, 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. That needs to be our prayer. And we need to have full obedience. Let it be unconditional and immediate. Our obedience needs to be unconditional and immediate. Don't take forever to confess your sin to God because it just gets worse and your heart gets hard. Let the voice of the Holy Spirit rule over our lives, rule in our lives. He will direct us as we pray and as we, we uh, and speak and read his word and direct us through our consciousness by his Holy Spirit. In Psalm 119, 105, his word says, The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When we read his word, our conscience will be seared. He will show us those things that are in us that we need to get rid of. Jeremiah 7.23 says, But this thing command I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you un unto you. So he's saying here in Jeremiah, obey my voice and I will be your God. That's it. Just obey his voice. We need to be immersed in God's word. You know, I remember when I first became a Christian and in and, and many of my younger years, when we got together for fellowship, we didn't watch football. We didn't just hang around act goofy. We opened up the word of God, and through that, I learned many, many things through opening up the word of God, and, and we had questions one to another, and they got answered. And out of those gatherings, sometimes we would end up in prayer, and we'd be having revival in our living room because we were speaking of the living word. Amen. Amen. God speaks to us through his word. He reveals himself and his holiness, and he shows us his expectations for us. That's the only way we're going to know is if we spend time in his word and in prayer. And when we read his word, we need to e expect an answer. God has given us many promises, and he will answer those promises that he's made. Remember, Amen. God, keep, God keeps his promises. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Amen. So everything you read in that word, he will keep his promise. We know that for sure. Amen. In Jeremiah 29.13, I already read this, but... I'll read it again. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye search for me with all your heart. We can't take this lightly. He says here, you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. How many times do we search for him with all our heart? Yeah, we do when we're going through trials or, or when we're sick or there's some tragedy going on in our life. But just on a daily basis, seek him with all our hearts. We need to get back to that. John 15, 7 says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. And here is the promise. If you abide in me, we have to abide in him, and my words abide in you. That means being obedient, spending time with him, seeking him, and it shall be done unto us. Revival is going to cost us something. If we really mean business with God, God will give us a new set of priorities. Amen? I'd like a new set of priorities. My priorities, they're not so good. I'm tired, I, I'm like uh, a lump on a log sometimes. But God will see us through. 
doesn't matter if my eyes are burning from looking at a computer all day. God will do something for me. He, he will give me a new set of priorities. When I make that first step, when I come home and I wash my eyes and I wash my face and I go in my room and I get before him, my eyes aren't going to hurt anymore. And if they do, it'll just be from tears of seeing who I am. We need to do a lot of heart searching, studying and praying and reading his word. He may even require us to have a change of lifestyle. Remember, it does not have to be a big sin that is not confessed to hold back the blessing of God. It may not even be what we would readily say is sin. But there are things that God wants for me, for Rebecca, for Pastor Tom, for Annie, for all of us here, that he, he may not want for Alicia, not that he doesn't want stuff for Alicia, but he may not require that area of her life because she's okay with that area. But he may require it of me. And those are the little things that we need to get cleaned up. Because we're believers in God, and, and to the best of our ability, we don't, we're not slave to sin. You know, if we sin, it's not on purpose. We don't go out and, and sin purposely. But we need to be aware of those little things that are causing that stoppage from him working through us. You know, we have the name Pentecostal. That's who we are. But as that song, Worthy, was up there, remember what it says in the book of Acts. All that happened when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Flames of fire upon their heads. Thousands getting saved speaking in tongues so every nation could hear the gospel of Christ. Amen? That's what we need to be. We have the name, but we don't have the power. Shame on us. God is not bound to send revival because we pray, but when we humble ourselves and seek God with total surrendered hearts, then he is bound to bless us with his promises. Amen? Jeremiah, oh, I'm, I already read that. That must have been like one of my favorite verses I kept going to. <laughs> so, and then, what conditions need to be in place for revival? Well, Second Chronicles 7.14, that has to be in place. We need to humble ourselves, and we need to pray and seek his face. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about Psalm 85. Wow, where did the time go? Uh, I have time. I'll, I'll speed it up. <laughs> and it says, revive us again. That's what the psalmist was asking, revive us again. We don't know who wrote this psalm. You know, I, King David wrote almost, you know, every psalm, but there was a lot of psalms written that, you know, we don't know who it was written by, and when I looked it up, it says most scholars believe it was written just after Israel returned from captivity in Babylon. Israel had been sent to Babylon for 70 years as punishment for their sins against the Lord. Now they have been restored to their land, but their hearts are still not where they need to be. The nation has experienced restoration but it stands in great need of revival. So God did restore them to their land, but yet their hearts, their hearts were not yet where they needed to be. I think Israel's situation parallels ours to a degree. We have been saved by grace of God and delivered from the penalty of sin. We have been blessed beyond words, amen, 
we are a, a blessed people. But we are not where we need to be with the Lord. Just like ancient Israel, the church stands in need of revival. Amen? Right in the very heart of this psalm, there is a plea for God to send his people revival. And that's in verse 6. It says, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? The word revival means to refresh, to restore, to live, to live prosperously. Revival supposes that there has been life in the past. That's what revival means. Something once was living, but now there is a need for a refreshing and a restoring of that life. Amen? We need to be refreshed. We need to be restored. When life is refreshed and, rest and restored, those who are revived will live on a higher, more prosperous level. That doesn't only mean in the physical, with good health or with prosperity, but in all areas of our life, all areas that you could think of, and spiritually being the most important. We need revival. I need revival. Everyone here needs revival. We need some things refreshed and some things restored. This psalm gives us a little insight into what revival, real revival involves. Revive us again, Lord. Amen. The psalmist remembers the past. That's in verse 1 through, one through 3. The psalmist looks back on where they were and what the Lord had done for them and gives him praise because of the blessings the Lord has given Israel. He remembers their captivity. He remembers the years of exile in Babylon. There is a need for us to remember where we came from. Amen? Sometimes I, I think every now and then, like, God touches me, and I remember where would I be if it wasn't for him. Lord, in his mercy, thank you, Jesus. Isaiah 51.1 says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye were hewn, and to the hole, the pit, whence you were digged. Ephesians 2.11-12 through 12 says, Wherefore, remember, that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. That was us. We had no covenant. We had no hope. We were without Christ in this world. You know, I'm not saying to glorify the devil, but just take a moment and think of times past where we would have been. The psalmist remembers their being brought back, being brought back to their rightful place. And that's what God has given us. Adam and Eve took that away from us, but God gave it back to us through his son. The psalmist remembers God forgave their iniquity, and he set their crooked path straight, just like he did ours. He set our crooked path straight. He remembers their conversion. He remembers when God gave peace instead of punishment so many times. You know, I thank God when something happens, like, thank you, God, that you didn't give me what I deserved. Amen? That he gave us peace in the place of punishment. He remembers when God turned his wrath away, and God so many times has turned his wrath away from us. In verses 4 through 7, the psalmist reflects on the present time. While they had much to be grateful for, there was still room for improvement. That's us. We have much to be grateful for, but there's still room for improvement. Israel was back in the land, but they weren't completely right with the Lord. The psalmist speaks of their condition. 
There is a need for repentance. God had brought them out of captivity, but all was not well in their hearts. So when you have time, read that psalm, and, and you'll see all these things that I'm speaking of because the time is getting short. This is a confession of need for repentance in the lives of God's people. The psalmist uses the word us. He is speaking of the need for national repentance. But national repentance begins with what? Personal repentance. We're not going to get national repentance. We're not going to get a revival out there in the streets until we have a revival in our own hearts. Amen? Amen. There is still a need among God's people for repentance. We need to examine our hearts and deal with anything that isn't pleasing to the Lord. Hebrews 12.1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Amen? We got to think about that race. So many times, you know, when I read when Paul says that, I'm like, it just excites me. And I, I say, yes, the race, the race. Sometimes I forget about it. We need to run that race to look forward to what God has for us. We're going to be entering the kingdom of God. Amen? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, the joy that was set before him, he loved us that much. The joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for your son. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that for us. There is a need for revival. The psalmist pleads for revival. He understands that revival does not come from man, methods, and messages. Revival comes from God. Amen? Amen. A revival is a sovereign move of God among a spiritually ready people. There is a need for revival in this nation. There is a need for revival in us. Revival will not begin on a national level. As I said, it will begin individually in our hearts and lives. What would real, real revival look like? Would it look like what we've seen in the past? People barking and doing all crazy things in church. No, it's not going to look like that. When real revival comes, there will be an overpowering sense of God's presence, his holiness, our commitment to him, our unashamed love for Jesus among the saved and deep conviction of who we serve in the community. We need to not be shamed. When revival comes, People will know who we are when we walk those streets. Revival will manifest itself among us, and not only us, but as we walk the streets, revival will break out amongst the sinners. Amen? Amen. Way back when, we heard stories of uh, tarot card places closing down and bars closing down. We will see that. Once we get right with God, we will see that on the streets. And now the, the end from 8 to 13, the psalmist rests in a plan. Having expressed the need for revival, the psalmist settles on a plan of action. So we've already started our plan of action, amen, here on Monday nights. He tells us what he will do to seek the Lord for revival. He will con conform to God's word. He will listen to the word of God and he will live it out in his life. Amen? This is the recipe for blessing, to live out the word of God and the will of God in our life. John 14, 15 says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And James 1, 22, But ye be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. We do. We deceive ourselves. We need to stop that. He will commit to God's ways. God has a plan for living. Those who are wise fear the Lord. We need to find that plan. We need to fear the Lord. And I'm trying to just pick stuff out here so I can hurry up. Um, 
the glory. We need the Shekinah glory of God. And the psalmist says he will contemplate God's wonders. You know, sometimes I just sit and I think of everything in this earth, of all the different animals, of us, of everything about us. And it's, it's overwhelming. I, I can't even figure things out. How our eyes are made and how our bodies are made and how the world stays on its axis. I mean, just amazing, amazing things. The wonder of his grace, verses 10 and 11, um, meet together. And that's where truth and mercy come together. And we thank God for his truth. And we thank God for his mercy. His truth is a shield and buckler unto us. Amen. And the psalmist says in verse 12, the wonder of his goodness. The writer believes that God's people will enjoy the blessings of the Lord yet again. He knows the heart of God, and the heart of God is to bless his people. He believes the day of blessing will come, and his glory will return. Amen? I believe that too. I believe if we continue to press on here on Monday nights, and we continue to get better in our private time, that we are going to see God move. We will see great things again. And in verse 13, that's the last verse of this psalm, the wonder of his guidance. God will lead his people to places of blessing, peace, and power. If they will just follow him, he wants to bless us and use us. Amen? Don't you think that it's time to make up your mind? If the Lord be God, then serve him. That's what Joshua said. If the Lord be God, then serve him. Not serving ourselves. Not serving our families. There's a time where we just have to say enough is enough. I need that time. I need to go in my closet. I need to seek God. We need revival. We need it in our personal lives, and we need it in the church. When we remember who we are and what the Lord has done for us, when we repent of our sins, we will be in a position where God can send revival. And once again, I'll end with this, Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I want revival. How about you? I know you do. That's why you're here tonight. That's why you're here every Monday. Let's seek God for more than just having a meeting. Let's continue to seek God the way we've been seeking him. But let's get more with him in our personal life so that when we come together, we will have more power. In Jesus' name, amen.